Today, I'm going to be talking about Byzantine opus octelli floors in the Levant. This came about because after I gave a program on um, Herodian floors and then Crusader floors, somebody said, what, you're skipping over Byzantine? I said, yeah, I'll put together a program on Byzantine. So that's what this is. Uh, one of the things about floors is that even though at an excavation, most of the walls are down, lots of times you still have parts of a floor left. So it's kind of interesting topic to look at, although not a lot of people do it. So with the Byzantine floors, we find them primarily in churches and in bathhouses. We do find them in a few mansions, but not really, but mostly churches and bathhouses. The picture here is the main bathhouse that's in Kasaria. Let me change this over to one picture over there. The main house bathhouse is in Kasaria. Uh, it's up on that level, not on the beach level, but just up slightly. And we'll come back to this picture a couple different times. For church floors in Israel, they're predominantly mosaics. Some of them are opus octelli. However, when you go over into Jordan, you find a lot more opus octelli floors. And that's because over there you had the cities of the Decapolis, or nine out of the 10 cities of the Decapolis are on the other side of the Jordan River. So they had lots of Roman buildings that were in ruins. And so the marble was available for the taking. So the church floors are made with the spoilia from the Roman buildings. The biggest difference you see in Byzantine floors from the Herodian ones is a color change. In the Herodian floors, you have lots of multicolor floors, either if they're local stones, or if they're imported, it's a lot of color in it. When we get into the Byzantine period, the floors have changed dramatically, and many of them are just white marble, different shades of white, or sometimes white with different accent colors with it. So there's a huge color change in these floors. This white marble is actually a very specific marble. It is Proconesian marble, meaning the mar marble from Proconesus. It's an island in the middle of the Marmara Sea. Another name for it is Marmara Chipolo, and Chipolo means onion, and that's because it looks like layers of an onion. They're in gray and white, or sort of a bluish gray and white color. Now, in the late Roman period, about 60% of all the marble that came into Israel is this Proconesian marble, and about 80% of architectural marble is all this Proconesian marble. The other uses for it besides architectural things are statuary, a lot of sarcophagi, and then household furnishing like tables and bowls and basins, things like that. Where this material comes from, this is the Marmara Sea. It is that body of water that separates the two parts of Turkey, and it connects the Mediterranean Sea with the Black Sea. And here's the island right there. Now, one thing you need to know is that the majority of our marble comes from this area, all in here in Turkey, along with these islands, and then just off to the left of the map, over into, into Greece. In looking at lots of floors and lots of pictures of floors, I've divided the Byzantine floors into four general pattern styles. The first one is a single pattern that's repeated over an entire room. This is like the bathhouse at Masada where you had three different rooms, they were a different pattern in each room, but the same pattern covered the whole floor. The next style is when you have multiple patterns within the same room, often with mix and match tiles. I'll explain later what that is. The third style is a very large central pattern called an emblema. And then the fourth style is very elaborate patterns that use many curvilinear cuts, meaning the tiles don't have straight edges, they have lots of curved edges on them. So we're going to go through these four styles one at a time. The first one is a single pattern repeated over an entire room or a large area. Here we have an example using just one tile shape. Square, uh, square tiles set on a diagonal. Um, here's a basilica over in Jordan that does this. Now this is pretty consistent, light, dark, light, dark as you go across the room. This is Proconesian marble, as is the, the trim along the side. I'm not sure what the, what the gray stone is in here. Um, I don't remember reading it in the text of exactly what kind of stone it is. Here's another one in a church in Jerash in Jordan. Again, it's just square tiles. Yes, there's triangles filling in along the side, but basically square tiles set on a diagonal. 
Here, they don't seem to follow the light, dark, light, dark pattern or anything like that. Maybe it was originally, and then certain things just got changed after over time. But basically, it's just square tiles set on a diagonal, a very simple pattern. Another pattern that uses only one shape, we're back to triangles again. But we've returned to the triangles that were used in the Roman floors, which is the equilateral triangle, where you've got the same size um, sides all the way around it and the same angles, as opposed to the Herodian ones where Herod was using that isosceles triangle. This is, in, this is part of the, that central bathhouse floor in Casaria. It's one floor section of it. Another uh, pattern that's made with a single tile shape is zigzags that are made with parallelograms. The parallelogram is a new tile shape that was introduced here in the Byzantine period. You don't see it in Herodian floors. And it was used, they will use the same color going across to make a zigzag pattern. This is the baptistry in a St. John the Baptist Church over in Jerash. A baptistry is where people were baptized. This is your mini mikvah that the Catholics would use. So here's the, here's the mikvah for the, the, baptist, uh, the baptismal font. And here is this really fancy floor using just parallelograms in order to create the pattern. We also have single patterns that were laid over the floors that had you know, different kind of shapes to them. Here's a square lattice pattern. You don't see this too much, but what you see is a square lattice with an extra square in the middle. So it's called a square lattice with the Q2 or the, the two squares pattern. This is a pattern that was used in Herod's third palace at Jericho in the triclinium. It's the intermediate pattern between the plain, the very simple chessboard pattern on the outside edge of the room, and then a really complicated pattern in the center. It was also used in um, Herod Antipas's palace in Tiberia. And you can see it here. This is in, again, in that central bathhouse in Casaria. Again, all this white marble is the Proconessian. You can see the gray streaks that are in it. The red is either Cipollino Rosso or Rosso Antico. One of them comes from Turkey, one comes from Greece. It's essentially the same marble. You can't tell by looking at it or under a microscope which one it is. You can only do it by testing of some kind of minor minerals that are in them. And then the little squares that are in here, um, these are slate. You see a movement from bitumen. You still have a little bit of bitumen around, but here you get slate that's in here. That's the little gray squares that are in this particular floor. Another place where the same pattern was used is another bathhouse that's in Casaria. It's in a Casaria suburb. The article was written by Kenneth Holm. Now, I don't know exactly where this floor is or if you can actually still see it, but when they excavated this bathhouse, they found three of the rooms, this one, this room, this room, and this room, are all using this pattern here. There's another room over here with a different pattern. We'll see that pattern in a few minutes. Here's another pattern that was used in the Herodian period, the one that has the interlocking circles. A lot of you have seen this floor in the Herodian quarter in the old city. There they used the white, li uh, white limestone, hex regular hexagons, black bitumen squares, and pink limestone triangles. So that your pattern was created by all these contrasting colors. Here over in this church in Pella in Jordan, it's all made with white marble. So this is the shift from multicolored floors over into one made with just white marble. There's a little bit of space in between the tiles where a little bit of the plaster is visible. And that's the only thing that gives you the design to the floors. In the, you know, when you have something laid like this, it's just the lines between the tiles gives you the pattern, not the contrasting colors of the tiles themselves. Here's another single pattern that was used over a whole room. It's the basic chessboard pattern, but here they put little squares in between. And this one is from a Byzantine church up in Susita. This picture was taken by a friend of mine. He's one of the archeologists works, that works up there every year, uh, Parents Ruvain. And I asked him, hey, while you're there, can you go take a picture for me? So he did a really nice job. He wet the tiles, put a ruler on it. So here's a pattern floor that was laid um, in this pattern there in the church. 
There's a development of more complex patterns also. This is one that was used several different places. It has three sizes of squares, a large square, a medium square, and a small square, plus this one size triangle that fits in between them. This is at the, they don't give the church a name, like, you know, it's not St. Peter's Church or St. Paul's Church, whatever. They just know it as the church adjacent to the Temple of the Lingwians in Petra. Again, you see lots of the Proconessian marble. All this is Proconessian marble, except for whatever this black is in between. This may actually be bitumen because they used a lot of bitumen up there, but I'm, I'm not quite sure what, the, what these little triangles are that are in here. This same pattern was used in the Nia church in the old city. Orrin Goodfelt was the excavator here, and they only found a very small portion of the floor still having tiles in it. And he says it's white marble and red marble. Um, I don't know if it's actually red limestone or red marble, but these are red and these guys here are white. Again, it's all the Proconessian marble. In order to get to fit this pattern, you have to turn this at a 45 degree angle, then it'll match up to the other one. So here's your large square. Here's the medium square, here's the small square, here's another one of these small squares. And then the little triangles that are in here. The way this is chipped looks to me like it's red limes, actually red limestone, not red marble. And at the um, tomb of Aaron on Mount Hor, it's up, uh, above Petra in Jordan, this same pattern was used on an outside edging, outside trim work, um, in, a, in a room. We'll come back to the central pattern later, but this portion of the floor where it actually goes all the way around all four sides of this big central square is made with this pattern given with three sizes of squares. Another pattern that's more complex, very similar to the last one, they've taken the small square in here and they've replaced it with a little rectangle. And this is a church over in, again, in Pella in Jordan. Again, all of this is Proconessian marble. I think what they were doing or was taking wall panels and then cutting them up and putting them on the floors in the churches. They're using wall revetments in order to create these floors. And in this back to the bathhouse in the suburb of Casaria, this fourth room, I told you these three were one, uh, were done in one pattern and this fourth room here is done in this pattern that has the large and medium squares in it and then the little rectangles. I don't know what material was used in this. In the report, it just has this drawing of the shapes. It doesn't say other than it's marble. It doesn't tell me really what kind of marble, what colors were used in there. The second type of pattern. This is where in a room you have multiple patterns often with mix and match tiles. What I mean by mix and match tiles is they seem to have cut out a lot of squares in one size and a bunch of triangles in one size and um, regular hexagons and elongated hexagons. And then they make patterns by mixing and matching the tile shapes and sizes. I'll show you some more specific ones in a second. Again, this is a central bathhouse in Casaria. Now what they did with these multiple patterns is they would lay rows of white marble slabs in the room and divide the room up into great big squares or rectangles. And each one of these areas gets a different pattern. Here's a really neat example of this style. It's a bathhouse over in Sardis in Turkey. It has 13 columns and seven rows, a total of 91 different pattern blocks. They used 15 different patterns, something like 17 different kind of marbles, so that between the difference in the marble and the different patterns, you have 91 different patterns or different patterns and colors over the whole floor. Here's a church that is divided into um, many different areas. Again, it's the church adjacent to the Temple of the Winged Lions in Petra. All of these are white marble slabs that divide the room into these different pattern blocks. And either they're done singly or they're done in pairs with different patterns to them. This church has 10 different patterns. There's an article by Lehi or Lehi Habas. Um, she's writing all about the architectural styles of the churches over in Transjordan, over there at, in Jordan. 
and one section of her chapter is on the floors. And she said this one uses 10 different patterns. Now in here I can show you a little bit better what I mean by mix and match styles. Here you have the same hexagon, oh, yes, the same regular hexagons used in two different patterns. You've got the triangles used in both of them. In this one, they put in a square. In this one, they put in a rhombus. And they've created an entirely different pattern because they switched out the squares for rhombi, plus another larger square in here. Or in this one, you have four triangles in here. Here again, you've got the same four triangles, but they totally changed the pattern by using a large hexagon in here. So they take them, they mix them, they mash them together, and they come up with all different kind of patterns. One new tile shape we're going to see is this, what I call an elongated hexagon. And I'll show you the difference in that one in a minute. But this is a tile shape that becomes very, very popular in Byzantine floors. Here it is used at St. John the Baptist tomb in Samaria, Sebastia. The main part of the floor that is still visible is done in this pattern. Along the edge, you have a simpler pattern with squares and uh, squares and triangles. These are done with the elongated hexagons, a square, and then they take some of these elongated hexagons, cut them off at the end so that you have a pentagon. Now, most of these, again, are um, Proconessian marble. Even when they're dark gray like this, some of them are. This one here looks like it's Bigio Antico, which is a gray marble. But most of these are just different variations on this white and gray Proconessian marble. When you go to that church, there's no sign over this door where you first come in off the street. I think there may be a sign farther in there. But this is up in Samaria Sebastia, if you ever get up there. This is another kind of neat floor. Um, it's made with multiple patterns, but to me, this floor looks like it is totally tiles in reuse, and it is a really jumbled up mess. It is sort of divided into different areas. This is the church, the Byzantine church, that's near the tomb of the Virgin Mary in the Kidron Valley. I don't know if any of you have ever been to this site. You've been to the tomb of the, the church of the tomb of the Virgin Mary, okay? This is the church that is just north of um, the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the church where you have to go down a hill or down some steep stairs down into the Kidron Valley itself. Just north of the church, in a fenced off, locked, gated area, are the ruins of this earlier church. You have to realize that the Kidron Valley used to be a lot deeper than it is now. It's been filled in with silt and dirt and rocks over many, many years, many, many decades, centuries. And so when they were excavating to try to find this church, this floor is about, I would say, four to five meters below ground level. These walls that you see around the outside are not the walls of the church. They're walls, they're retaining walls that were put up after the excavation to hold this part of the floor open. So when you go to see this, you are standing on the rim of this hole, looking down into it. So when I took this picture, I'm probably four to five meters above the floor level, up on top of this retaining wall, so that you can see down into it. But here, this really looks like a jumbled up mess. You can't tell it too much from the stones because there's so much dust and dirt down in there. But this was a drawing that was done during the excavations. You can see all the different shapes, but it looks like they're all in secondary use. And it's a very, like I said, it's a very jumbled up mess in there. Now, about these regular hexagons and elongated hexagons. In the Herodian patterns, and also you've seen in some of the Byzantine patterns, we have what's called a regular hexagon. It means it's got six sides, they're all the same, and all six angles are the same. What you see in a lot of the Byzantine floors are what I call elongated hexagons. It's still got six sides, so it's a hexagon, but it's not a regular one anymore. Regular means they're all the same size. What you have here are two longer sides and four shorter sides. Usually they are two 90 degree angles and four 135 degree angles. This is actually created, or this shape is created by taking two squares and laying them point to point. 
and then the distance between them is the diagonal of the square. So it's almost like you've taken a square, square tile and chopped off two corners of it, but it is a very, very versatile tile shape. And so you see it in a lot of floors. Here's the one I think John the Baptist up in Samaria Sebastia again. Here it's used in this particular pattern with one size of squares. And then they've cut off the edge of it to get these pentagons in order to make a straight edge along the side. Down in the church near the tomb of the Virgin Mary. Okay, back down in that hole. Kind of take your camera and do a zoom shot on it. And here's a bunch of these elongated hexagons lying down there in the dirt at the bottom. This is not a ruler. This is a random stick that was in there. And here are some elongated hexagons that are actually still in situ in a pattern on the floor. Here's a really nice floor done with this, with these elongated hexagons. This is St. Euthymius Mon Monastery over in Mishur Adramim. This is actually a crusader floor. The building is a Byzantine building that was reconstructed somewhat, and this is part of the crusader floor. Again, you see these elongated hexagons being used here. Here you've got a, a larger square in there, and then you've got a smaller square that's used in this pattern. This particular floor is made out of limestone and sandstone, and the sandstone is really worn down on it, whereas the limestone is still uh, harder on it. These tiles have been found lots of different places. Over in Akko, there's, they were digging in a, um, they were getting ready to construct some kind of a new building over there, and there was a salvage day going on. And in there, they found pieces that appears to be from a Byzantine church. And here you've got a lot of these hexagons. Almost all of them are, um, let's see, almost all of them are the Proconesia marble. This one, though, is something called Greco Screto. In the Gavati parking lot dig, they found a lot of these. They found them in two different sizes. In the Temple Mount Sifting Project, we found a lot of them there. So they were used a lot in different places. And the reason was because it's so versatile. So here we've taken the same size elongated hexagon. This is the pattern that was at the floor, on the floor that you saw in St. Uh, John the Baptist Church in Samaria Sebastia. This pattern, just using the elongated hexagons, uh, was used in that bathhouse in Sardis. This particular pattern, using triangles along with these elongated hexagons, is in an apse in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, but it's not one that's open to the public. I don't even know if the floor is still visible in there, but when they were doing excavations in there, there was a whole jumbled up mess of different kind of floors in there, and this was one of the patterns that was in there. I'm actually wondering if this particular pattern um, is still some that's left over from a Byzantine floor that was in there, even though you know, the caption on the picture says it's the 11th century, but they, that may have been the second round of it was 11th century, and this is actually Byzantine. And then this particular pattern here that uses the same size square that you had over there, plus the smaller square, this is the one at, at um, St. Euthymius Monastery in Mishra Adarmi. Next out of the floor. Something with a large central emblema. Emblema is the same thing as an emblem, so it's a great big pattern in the middle of a room. Generally with these, lots of these emblemas have this eight-pointed star pattern that looks basically like a cross pattern in it. Now you have to understand that for a while, cross patterns were used in mosaic floors and stone floors in churches on the floor. Then the Pope decided that, oh, you really shouldn't put crosses on the floor because that's how Jesus died on a cross and you shouldn't put a cross on the floor then for people to walk on. So I think this is a cross pattern that was changed slightly to make it into an eight-pointed star. But this particular pattern or this basic pattern of this eight-pointed star shows up a lot and you'll see several of them here. Now what they would do with this is they could use this in the middle of a room. It might be the only thing in the room. It might be surrounded by white mosaic tiles. It might be surrounded by other open sectili tiles. It might be surrounded by big white marble slabs. So it's different in each place and how this gets used. This one is in the central bathhouse in Casaria. 
It's not out in the palestra in the big main building. This was a smaller room to the side. And it's surrounded on the outside by these white marble tiles. And then you're right up against the wall. There's a door entering this small room right here. And I think there was another door right over there. So it turns out that this pattern occupies the entire room. Now, the way this kind of a pattern always runs is the four corners are the same pattern. These four central sections are the same pattern, just rotated around. And then there's always something, something in the middle of the square in the very center of it. Here is a similar pattern in the palestra of the central bathhouse in Casaria. So here's this big central pattern again. The four patterns in the corner are slightly more complicated than the sample that I put here. This has got four little triangles sitting in the four corners here to make it slightly more ornate. This is only a few meters away from that last one. Here's one, I showed you this picture before. This is the tomb, uh, the church of the tomb of Aaron on Mount Hor up above Petra. In this building, there is a dome right above here. Directly under the dome is this emblema with an eight pointed star pattern in it. Similar to this one, a little bit more complicated. Instead of um, only four triangles here, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, whatever, um, triangles in this area. The four patterns on the outside are a little more complicated. It doesn't have a circle in the middle, but it's got this square in the middle with design on it. In this particular floor, the emblem was in the center. It then was surrounded on all four sides by white marble slabs, then on all four sides by this opus sectili pattern, then another row of, of, of white marble slabs, and then this very complicated pattern to the outside. Here's an actual picture of that floor. There has been a wall erected over part of the floor, so you don't actually see the entire pattern of it anymore in here. But you can see the central emblema, white marble, some of the sectili tiles, more white marble, and then the more complicated pattern out on the outside of it. Here's a place where this pattern was used on its own in the apse of a church. This is down in the East Church in the Nabataean city of Elusa or Kalutsa. It'll be written different ways. This was a three apse church. It's got an apse, a large apse, and another small apse, okay? And in this small southern apse is an opus sectili pattern that's done in this eight-pointed star motif again, a little bit simpler than, than this one over here. Um, and then it's totally surrounded just by white marble slabs. In the north apse, way over here, there's another pattern block in the middle, and it's just simply the square tiles laid on a diagonal, a basic chess chessboard pattern in it. But the southern apse has got this central eight-pointed star in it again. Now we move to the last style. It's what I call elaborate patterns with many curvilinear cuts. You can see what I mean here. You've got spiral, you know, spiral patterns with the tiles. You've got floral patterns, so everything's cut with, with curved edges. It's much harder to cut curved edges than straight edges. So you find in this kind of floor, a lot of it is done, especially the more elaborate cuts, are done with limestone. It's easier to cut into these elaborate shapes than it is with marble, because marble has a large crystal in it. So when you're trying to cut it, your crystals can break away and you don't get as clean of an edge. If you do it with limestone, you get really clean cut edges. Now, where is this kind of stuff from? Well, the main place that we found this is in a Byzantine Opus Sectelli workshop down in Casaria. It was found in 1894. There's an article written about it by Yeshu Dre. He's the guy who um, is working up at uh, Umal Khanatir, reconstructing the, the synagogue up there that's made out of basalt. Same yesterday. Okay, so he wrote an article about this kind of floor. When they found this workshop in Kasaria, it is attached or it's one room in a large villa. Evidently, the archaeologists think that what was going on is they were making these panels to decorate the rooms in the villa. They could have been used on the floors, they could have been used on the walls. And then at some point, 
Evidently, the city was about to be attacked either by the Persians in 614 or by the Muslims in 638. So they closed off this room and these panels were never transferred into the other rooms in the building. Evidently, they were standing up along the side walls and then collapsed down because when they started excavating, they were finding layers and layers of these stones with layers of plaster between them. Now, how were these prefabricated panels made? What you would do is take um, the marble that you wanted to use, marble, limestone, whatever, cut, design your floor, and then cut out all the pattern tiles. Lay them flat down on a flat surface. It doesn't matter if they're skinny or large. Some of these things are only three, four, five millimeters thick. They're very thin. So it doesn't matter what the thickness is. Lay them out on a flat surface, cover it all over with plaster. In this case, the plaster that they're using is that pink opus signinum plaster. That's the plaster that has all the little tiny red chunked up pottery in it, crushed pottery. So it gives it a, a pink look. Then on top of it, you put these pottery shards. You lay it over the whole top of it. When the whole thing solidifies, you have something like plywood, but it's ply stone or ply stone and, and pottery. You can pick up that whole panel, take it to the site, either flip it over and put it down on the floor or put it up against a wall. For a floor, all you'd have to do then in the building where you're working is just prepare the floor so that it's nice and level. Take your panel, stick it down, your floor is done because it was pre-constructed in a workshop. In yesterday's article, he goes through 10 steps that it took to create these kind of floors from designing the floors, cutting the tiles, trimming the tiles, polishing the tiles, putting on there, doing your plaster and everything. So you get a good idea of how it was done. Now something's very interesting is there was an, um, an etching from the Baths of Diocletian that shows how this was done. Here's the mason and he's working on his flat table up here. He's put all his tiles onto it face down and now it looks like he has a jug and a stick. He must be mixing up his plaster that he's going to put over top of these in order to prepare this as a panel. Okay, you see that it's sitting up on in the state. See, we call these saw horses. Over here, we call them mules. I don't care whether you call them horses or mules, whatever it is. They provide him an easy workspace because uh, the panel is, is up on a flat table, up at waist height, and he can work on this and prepare these panels. Then once you put all the plaster on and the um, pottery shards on the top of it, you let the whole thing solidify, it's done, set it over against the wall and you can start on a new one. Um, at the Promontory Palace in Casaria, we found a bunch of these tiles with all these curves and the really fancy things here. It looks like a floor to leave without the center. You have the, um, what do you call it? Flo uh, flower petal shape designs and teardrops. This over here is a shield. Now, you have to know that in Latin, the term you use for this kind of a floor is opus sectili. Opus being worked, sectili is cut. So they're cut and worked tiles. In Greek, this kind of floor is called scutlosis, which means little shields. Because a lot of the tiles, I lost my cursor again, because a lot of the tiles look like little shields. So, Scutlosis in Greek is equivalent to opus sectili in Latin. So these are different, different tiles that were among the tiles that I worked with from uh, the Promontory Palace at Casaria. So we know that part of this, um, or the, this palace in Casaria was still being used at the same time that these kind of floors were being manufactured, which was almost at the beginning of the seventh century. A really nice floor that used this pattern is a church on the Mount of Olives that was exca excavated by Bliss and Dickey in 18, 1894. Remember the bathhouse was excavated in 1994. Okay, um, this was on an excavation site up on the Mount of Olives. They were getting to ready to build a bunch of houses and when they're digging the foundations they ran into a, um, a mosaic floor. So Antiquities Authority, or whatever it was called at the time, 
was notified and Bliss and Vicki were sent in for one week to do a salvage dig to figure out what was going on up there before the rest of the construction went on. They're looking at the mosaic floor and they realize it's probably a church. So what they do is they start working eastward toward the apse and sure enough, when they get to the central apse, it's got this beautiful opus actelli pattern in it. Just in front of the apse, you've got all these circles with tiles that are made cut in those little tiny thin strips, some really nice floral patterns on it. And then in front of that was a long row of little tiny squares. So these don't really sit right where they're on the picture, but like square, 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 across here. And you can see all these really ornate patterns. Now, when they were digging, they found something very unusual and they just simply documented it in in their report. I was reading this report one day and going, oh my gosh, I know what's going on. It says, the excavation has revealed that the Opus Actelli pavement was placed on a matrix of potsherds that had been laid on the native clay. So what had they really found? They found the panel that had been a prefab panel flipped over and sitting there in the ground. Because first they found the tiles, they went under it through the plaster, they found the potsherds, and underneath it is just the dirt that it was laid on. When I saw this comment in the article, I thought, oh my gosh, this is what was going on down in Casaria. The difference was this was dug in 1894. They didn't understand what it was, but they documented it. This is why in an archeological site, you document what you see, even if you don't understand it. Even if you can't figure out really what is going on, document exactly what you observe, write it down. And like they did, they drew pictures of it. You know, even if they didn't know what was going on underneath here, they made a comment that they found the potsherds in here. It wasn't until a hundred years later, in 1994 with that excavation, that finally we know what he was talking about and what, or what Bliss and Vicki were talking about and what they found up here. I actually wrote an article about this site and this comment about this matrix of pot shards and talked about how sometimes at a site you don't know what you have until a hundred years later. And it took a hundred years for the archeologists to figure out what this pot shard stuff was all about in Bliss and Vicki's um, dig. So if you want that article, it's a short one that I wrote about this Mount of Olives and the Casaria workshop and that it took a hundred years to figure out what was going on in here. I have it, I can send it to you if you want it. We have found these kind of tiles at other sites around the country. Um, this is a Byzantine church on Ketepi Nome. It was first excavated by Gabi Barkai starting in the 70s. He had like six digs between the middle 70s to the big, mid 90s. And these are two pictures that are out from his digs. It's in two different articles um, about, the, about the whole dig, but not specifically, and not very much about the floors, other than one-liners about, oh yeah, the head of a sector like floors. Basically, that's it. Later on, it was excavated again by Rena Avner and Yachiel Zillinger. And this is the picture that they had with some more of these little tiles. And these tiles here are more of Gabi's tiles that were from his dig there in 1994. This is a picture that I took of some of his tiles. And in here, you can see more of those little scutlosis tiles, those, those little shields. Here's one here. And then this one, I should have turned it the other way around. That's the bottom of the shield there. There's the top of the shield. So this is why these things are called shields, because they look like little shields. Also in here, you've got the flat, these kind of flower petals and those kind of flower petals. You've got teardrops. You've got this wildly carved something, have no idea, little circles, all different kinds of things. Um, on the Temple Mount Sifting Project, we have a bunch of these, um, all different kinds of size and shapes, but all with these curved edges on them, which are typical of these Byzantine floors. Um, also, we have this shape in some Crusader floors. So these two guys here may be Crusader, but for right now, they're in this picture of all these little curly Q tiles. Other places where we have these, Gibachi parking lot dig. I have a picture, but I can't put it in here. Um, there is an article on the whole marble collection from the Gibachi parking lot that's been written by Jana Chikanovich. It will appear in their final report of 
the dig that was headed up by Yana and Jerome Benamy, but that article has not been published yet in full. The article was published, the text of it, plus a few of the pictures are in an article in um, uh, Liberanus Journal, which is a Franciscan journal. When I read it in one of her footnotes, Yana says, and then we had about a dozen tiles that are really small and thin, and they all got curvilinear edges on them. But it's in a footnote. She didn't even put it in the regular text, and she didn't put the picture in. So I asked her about it. She sent me the picture on the promise that I will not post the picture anywhere until it shows up in their final report. So it's really neat. It's got all these same kind of curvy little pearly hue tiles in it, but I can't show it to you. I have three more I can't show you too. <laughs> this is because people keep con contacting me. Okay, the first, first group is here in Israel. This was from a dig. The dig is done with. I have actually written my part of the article on these tiles. Um, because it's at a church, somebody's gonna add in a section on glass, somebody's gonna add in a section on uh, some of the architectural elements and we're gonna publish that all together. So um, I have a picture of that, but I can't show it to you because it's not out yet, sorry. The second one is another dig here in Israel. I was called in to look at the tiles when the people found them. They have not even announced yet that they have found these things. Therefore, I can't even tell where, where it is other than it's here in Israel. I will be publishing that article. I've actually gone through um, a couple crates of material that they have, all these little curly tiles really neat. I've been able to figure out a bunch of the patterns that they have in there. The third one is over in Jordan. Um, last year in November, I spoke at the Evangelical Theological Society's conference in Tel Aviv. I gave one presentation on Herodian floors and then one on uh, Crusader floors. And after it, one of the archaeologists came to me and said, I've got all these little curly tiles and a Byzantine floor over there. You have any idea what I have? And I'm going, Oh yeah, that's sure. So I sent him the articles and the pictures that I have. He sent me a picture of his, but he has not published it yet. Um, I probably will not be the one publishing that. I think he, he can do it himself. He's got, um, I send him all the articles that he needs to give his parallels to. So that's the next one over there in Jordan. So if you want to summarize the characteristics of Byzantine tiles, we'll look again, just like we did at Crusader, I mean, yeah, not Crusader, but Herodian ones with size, shape, material, color, and craftsmanship. In sizes, they appear to still be using the Roman foot. A lot of the tiles seem to be based on the Roman foot 29.6 plus the half, quarter, and eighth of that dimension. Also, the Roman foot divided by the square root of two, which is a square with a diagonal of one Roman foot. The size of the square is the Roman foot di uh, divided by the square root of two. And the measurements are 20.9 centimeters for the square and then half, quarter, and eighth of that. These are common sizes that I'm finding. Also, many of the circular cuts, when they set the radius on their compass in order to measure these, they are using either 3.7 centimeters or the 5.2 centimeters, which tells me they're still using a Roman foot measurement in them. For the shapes, the standard geometric shapes that were used in the Herodian period, plus they've added the elongated hexagons along with the regular hexagons. They've started using those parallelograms and they've started using pentagons. And then the shapes with the curvilinear edges have been added. Circles, circle segments, teardrops, donuts, floral designs, waves, birds. Yes, one of these sites that I've been allowed to look at their material, they have birds cut out. It is a full bird cut into a tile and it becomes part of these curly patterns. And then the narrow curved circular and spiral bands. For the materials and colors, I told you there's this huge switch over to the white Proconessian marble. For the contrasting colors, there's usually red and it's either the Cipollina Rosa or Rosa Antico, um, which are from Turkey and Greece. In a green, it's typically Cipollino Verde. Again, the Cipollino means onion, so it's got all these layers in it, but it's a green onion instead of a white onion. For gray, it's either slate or Bigio Antico, that means ancient gray. So these are the two grays that you see. Occasionally, there's other white marbles in here that are not Proconessian. I haven't tested these to see exactly where they're from. 
Um, also, you'll see some bitumen and then lots of different rhinestone colors and a whole rainbow array of colors. When you get into the prefab panels, because the pieces are very small and very thin, you start seeing some new, more expensive imports, specifically Porfido Rosso or red porphyry that's from Egypt, Porfido Verde de Grecia or Serpentino, or it's green porphyry from Greece, or it's otherwise called Serpentino. Um, you'll see some of that kind of a yellowish green, very squared off inclusions, not little tiny round ones. And then certain granites out of Egypt, particularly this, partic this particular um, granite here, which is really, it's not black, but very, very dark green and white. Also in some places, specifically in Kasaria, I see pa uh, pieces that are cut into these very small tiles using um, corroding materials that are in reuse. Why do I know they're in reuse? Because I find like a lot of them made out of giallo antico, this ancient yellow. However, by the Crusader, I mean by the Byzantine period, um, the quarry for giallo antico has been closed for 200 years. So it tells me they're reusing Herodian tiles that they found. The same thing with Africano tiles. I also find pieces that are cut out of calcite alabaster. Uh, now that one, it may be it may be in reuse, it may be new, but I think a lot of it is also in reuse. Craftsmanship. The tile cutting is not as precise as the Herodian period. So the tiles vary more in sizes within a given floor. Because of that, we see more mortar between the tiles. And this is how you see the actual pattern of the tiles in a totally white floor is this mortar that you're actually seeing now between the tiles. They still have beautiful polishing and edge finishes on them, but the fact that they are kind of wonky when they come around to cutting all their tiles the same size, um, it's, it's not as, they're not as, as clean in construction as in the Herodian patterns. Best places to see these kind of floors, um, the, the Byzantine open sectile floors. Casaria Central Bathhouse has got to be the best place. Casaria was the marble import city. So you see a lot of the marble there in that bathhouse. It's got the columns around it and everything. Most of you have, you've been through there, you've seen that. Also down on the beach, just north of the Hippodrome is a mansion that has some really nice opus octelli tiles in it. If you're up at Susita, the churches that are there, uh, and Beit Sha'an, remember this is one of the Decapolis cities. So it had, they had a less, lot of leftover marble from, from, um, from Roman buildings. And so I remember that near the bathhouse and the Sigma building, there was a huge opus octelli floor. I think it was just like square panels though. I don't remember it being very decorative. And then the Crusader floor that's done in the same Byzantine style is that St. Euthymius Monastery. So the best place really to go to see this is when you're down at Casaria, look down at the floor that you're walking on. And that's it. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing this and we'll go over here for anybody who has any questions or comments. Can you check the We're chat? Open floors okay, I'm, yeah, I'm looking at this, I'm, I'm reading Ellen's. Were open sectile floors contemporaneous with marble? Yes, in fact, in some floors, you'll have part of the floor done with open sectile and part of them done with, um, with regular mosaics. We'll go back up here, start at the top. Um, Michael's at seven o'clock tonight. Okay, tune in then. Let's go. Baptistry in Jerish. Um, at one point, crosses on the floors. Right, they're outlawed. They quit using them. This is why I think that pattern originally started off more like a, a, a cross, and it got switched into this eight-pointed star to say, "Oh, it's not a, it's not a cross anymore. It's an eight-pointed star." Um, isn't it considered, yeah, that one over there is considered a cross. So I'm not sure why that one is was there, although it's very large and maybe they're saying, well, it's not really like a cross, but yeah, it is. But that's like a six, like a sixth century church over there. So I think it's actually after the time when they had, when they said you shouldn't be doing crosses. See, send to the article. Yes, see, I'll do that. Okay. Um, how did one cut the stones, especially the curved ones? Very carefully. Okay, they were doing it with an iron saw. And I've also read an article that later on they were using some kind of a cord, but I don't quite understand how they were using the cord to cut it. 
Um, but it was done with a, with a very fine saw, but they were just better at it during the Byzantine period. So you can see these very ornate kind of cuts that you don't see in the Herodian one. Yes, Sveig, with great difficulty. Okay. Um, where the contemporaneous, yes, the two are contemporaneous and you'll see both kind of floors. In fact, in some places you will have the tiles and in between, like one, like you'll have a square tile and then the next square over is a little mosaic and then another square tile and then a square made out of little mosaics. In it. So that's the questions in there. So anybody else has any other comments or questions? Go ahead. Frankie, this was so interesting. I feel like I want to take, I want to go with you to Caesarea, just walking around from room to room. Yeah. If I, need to, you know. I need to go back down there again. So if somebody has a car and you're going back down there to Caesarea, I need to go sometime. Okay. I need to where, where do you live? Jerusalem. Yeah, I'm at Macorhaim in Jerusalem, right off of, of um, Derek of Rome. Okay, not very far off of there. Right behind Kenyon Hadar is where I am. Okay. Um, at Kasaria, in the theater area, they have been working there on the stage. The stage area has been under construction. And there's a big barrier that's set up between the orchestra area and the stage. That um, barrier sits right on top of some tiles that I need to see. The last time I was down there in December with a friend, we went down there and poured water on a bunch of tiles. And we found some of the original tiles that were laid around the year 125 or so that were laid in that um, orchestra. Now, I've got to look in the articles, but the articles I've been able to find so far doesn't tell you how to distinguish the original tiles versus ones that got put in, patched in later. Because the whole floor is covered with marble, but most of it is the Proconestian marble. It's just plain white, it's the um, Chipolina Verde, it's the green with the stripes in it, which were later ones. But some of the original tiles that were laid, oh sorry, they weren't laid in 125. They were laid in the second quarter of the first century. So it's sometime between the year 25 and 50 was when they were laid. And I was able to identify certain tiles because of the type of marble. What was imported in the Herodian period is not imported later. So if you know what got parted, imported when and when the importation stopped and when new things start, you can date the tiles. And I found a bunch of brand, a bunch of the really old ones still there. And I was able to identify like about five different marble varieties in there that I would totally expect in a Herodian floor that you don't see in late Roman and you don't see them in Byzantine. But I have to wait for them to take that barrier down so I can see the rest of it because they're going right up against the very front of the stage. So when that barrier comes down, I'll make another trip. Now somebody put something else on the chat. What was that? Pouring water on the stones. Um, seem to me it damages the stones. Well, you really shouldn't go pouring on it, but if you want to get a book, good picture, I have found you got to pour water on it. So the ones, um, thank you, Steve. <laughs> uh, so when, when I go to take a picture, um, I take a, a brush with me and I'll brush on some water to darken it enough to take the picture. That's what I did with that uh, big central emblema there at, uh, at Casaria when I was trying to get that one that had that big eight pointed star in it, was get water on it fast enough so that the sun and the wind don't dry it out before you can get up and take your picture on it. Uh, but it gives you the deeper colors so that you can see what it is. But it's a lot of fun running around and looking at all this stuff and it's just need to do. And I told Judy that I have another program that is specifically on the um, on the Promontory Palace in Casaria that I can do for you guys. The program is all together. I have given it two places already. I gave it at uh, Osmosia, an Osmosia Conference. Osmosia is Association for the Study of Marbles in Antiquity. It's an international group. They meet every two and a half to three years. I spoke at their conference in Izmir, Turkey um, about a year and a half ago. And I spoke on the, uh, all the different tiles that I had from Kasaria and how I was able to sort them out into different dates and tell you what was going on and how the building was, what was in the building originally, what was in later renovations, 
and then how long the building was in use simply by boxes of, of out of out of context tiles. We were able to do that. And so it's actually put together in a full program. I also gave the, the same program for one of Guy Stiebel's classes down at Tel Aviv University. He invited me to come down there and speak on that. So I, I gave it at Tel Aviv University to one of Guy's classes down there. So the package is ready. I can run it for you guys and you can learn more about the Promontory Palace down there in Kasari. So I'll do that in a couple of weeks for you. Okay, and, uh, and then we should organize a tour there. Yes. By then the walls should be dead. The, uh, the, yeah, the I spoke to them. Yeah, I spoke to them. Let's see, I marked it on the calendar when I called them down there and asked. I called them on the 14th of June, and they thought the barricades would be down in two to three weeks. So hopefully by now, or you know, a couple more weeks here, it'll be down, and I can call back down there and ask them. I actually found somebody who spoke English and somebody who knew what I was talking about. He says, "Oh yeah, it'll be down in a couple more weeks." And Good, because I need to come down there once it's down, because a lot of the stuff I needed to see were under the legs of this barrier, or the, the base of the barrier, yeah. Well, I, I, I suspect that um, if, if it's announced when you're going, when you want to go to Caesarea, not only will you have a driver, but you'll have a lot of people shadowing you. Oh, so. oh we'd love to do that. It's fun. Um, I mean, what was that you were at? I, I was up there. Okay. Oh, the barrier's down. Oh, good. Oni, thank you. Right. The barrier's down. So we can plan to go down there sometime if the barrier's okay. down. Okay. We will work on that. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Frankie, Bye. this was very interesting. Uh, again, wonderful. Thank you very much. And we look forward Thanks. to seeing you in two weeks again. Okay. Right. Okay. And guys, we, will, we have something on this Tuesday. So please join okay. us. Okay. Right. Everybody oh, well. have a wonderful day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Frankie. Bye-bye.